It's a great honor to be here as well. So now uh, it's uh, time to try to zoom out a little bit and reflect on the larger context in, in which um, we all are laboring. And we're all very excited about the uh, rapid technical advances that have been occurring in the last uh, few years. Um, and this has helped trigger a, a wider dialogue about uh, where AI is going, how it's going to impact society, and what happens if we actually succeed uh, at the original ambition, which has all along been to uh, create machines that have the same general intelligence as, as we humans have, the same general powerful learning ability and planning abilities that make us smart. Um, so in this context, there are a number of these different visions floating around, models for what, what, what is the future of AI that, that look very different. So one vision is uh, something like this, that AI is about gadgets and apps and bots and services and, and more and more consumer devices and you know, some slightly more efficient ways of doing different things in a variety of different sectors. Um, so so that, that kind of meme is out there. And another is that this is actually going to be a very profound thing, um, something perhaps best analogized to previous revolutions in the human condition. And, and if you really zoom out, there may be arguably have only really been two events in all of human history that have fundamentally changed the rules of the game. Um, the agricultural revolution and the uh, industrial revolution. With the industrial revolution for the first time in all of human history, you started to get technological growth rapid enough that it outstripped population growth. Th this is a momentous moment because for the first time it was possible for average wages to start to rise. So we exited the Malthusian condition that had characterized the human species as it has characterized other animal species uh, for, for tens of thousands of years. Um, so will machine intelligence be something like that, something that will profoundly change the, uh, the, the very nature of the human condition? Um, you could argue that it could be even more profound than that, 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 that both the agricultural revolution and industrial revolution and all the smaller events have all been produced and operated through the human brain. And, and maybe if we one day create machines that exceed humans in general intelligence, much like we exceed, say, the great apes in general intelligence, then may maybe you get an event that if you search for some historical parallel should rather be compared to the rise of Homo sapiens in the first place. Um, like that, that's the maybe most recent case where we had a serious leveling up of the various the very substrate that is doing the further inventing, thinking, planning, and organizing, and experiencing. You could even run the argument that it could be an even more profound shift, because if you look at the difference between the great ape brain of our ancestors and the human brain, they are really not that different. Um, there's a slight scaling up, you know, by a modest factor, and some small algorithmic tweaks, which cannot be too many or too complicated because, you know, there have only been something like, what, uh, 2,000 generations or whatever from our last common ancestor. And that's just not very much evolutionary time. It's not enough to build up large, complicated mechanisms. So, so some relatively small changes are really responsible for all the differences that we see between the human condition, as it is now in air-conditioned rooms in the middle of the desert, uh, uh, and, um, you know, picking bananas of, of great trees. So, but the, the, the step towards this possible machine intelligence future could potentially be much greater. You could have brains the size of warehouses or arbitrarily large, uh, using entirely new physical substrates. So, so that, that's kind of one different vision, that this, this is really perhaps more profound than anything that has happened uh, ever. Uh, and, and then, of course, there are these kind of uh, set of visions from the science fiction movies where um, typically the uh, AIs are uh, an ominous threat. Um, so um, I want to talk about what is possible and realistic and, and what, how has the dialogue about these questions been developing over the last few years. So let's um, first make a little distinction here. There are kind of two possible um, bases on which you can construct some model of the future. Uh, most talk about the future 
is primarily intended to entertain or sell product. The future is usually a projection screen upon which we display our hopes or fears, paint dystopias or utopias that are not really about the future, they're about critiquing trends in present society. Um, but it is also possible to care about the future for its own sake, like actually to care about what happens. Um, and so uh, today I want to set aside those uh, um, first class of scenarios and theories and thinking and, and just focus on the subset of future-oriented thought that is actually concerned with trying as best as possible to be right because the idea is that maybe these beliefs can guide action in some way. Um, so I think a prerequisite to having any kind of intelligent, constructive conversation about this is to introduce um, a timeline and to recognize that there are different contexts here. Um, contexts that are all in their own right legitimate and serious and worth serious conversation, but, but they need to be kept separate because there are different issues that arise in each of these contexts. So, um, if, Let's go through these. So in, in, in this, this book that I had a couple of years ago, it primarily focuses on, on the long term and the very long term, and we'll get to that shortly. But let's just first briefly um, view the, the short term here. So, so here we have a number of um, characteristic uses and capabilities that are sort of either already available or we can imagine various incremental improvements and extensions. And, and all of this is certainly uh, going to happen and improve over the next five or 10 years. There is really no controversy. And the kinds of questions that um, might arise if, if this short term is the context that we are focusing on uh, would be issues like, I, th I think there are some kind of more or less distraction issues. You, every once in every few months there is another sort of media blitz about some embarrassing thing done by some AI system. Uh, the, 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 uh, the Google uh, image classifying uh, some, some um, black person as a gorilla. Or like, and, and then there was like uh, some Nikon camera software that, um, that, that tended to uh, classify Asian people as they, they were having their eyes closed. And so, so this is going to keep happening. And every once a few months, there's going to be a little thing like that. I, I don't really think that that is where the serious issues lie. These are like, embarrassing, should be fixed, everybody agrees, that's not, not going to really impact most people's lives very profoundly. And, and another one of these that I think is kind of achieving too much attention is car ethics. People, people love to discuss journalists, like if a self-driving car has this choose, you know, between running over like one five-year-old kid or two eight-year-old uh, ladies, like, yeah, okay. Um, so I, I think that the more like significant issues are, are uh, ones I list there. So society is transitioning um, from um, what we assume to be the normal condition where we have like a lot of privacy and uh, to, to a transparent society where it will be possible to keep track of where everybody is at any given time, um, store that data uh, for decades, mine that data, plot the graphs, figure out who is associated with what, what affiliations they have, who might be plotting a rebellion. Um, and and I, I think that, that that seems to be one of the more profound changes that are happening in the world. We don't have the kind of political science that can predict how political dynamics will change when you have complete track records uh, following people around. So I, I think that that's a potentially important effect. Uh, military applications uh, do receive some you know, autonomous weapon systems and so forth. Um, do we want a new arms race in that direction? Um, algorithmic so, so, more, so as, as, as algorithms get more and more widely used to make different classifications, whether it's your credit score or whether it's, you know, whether you should be given parole or other things, um, uh, we need to become more alert to how those algorithms operate. What are the assumptions embedded in them? Do they inadvertently perhaps sometimes discriminate against various groups? And to open up that for transparency, and, and I think that's there's going to be a number of cases uh, in that where society has to make decisions. Um, and, and, and exclusion and access, which is used in many technology areas, like how can we ensure that, that people, uh, all groups of society have access to social services, that people around the world can also participate in this. Um, so, so, some of, so, so I think if, if the context is short term, uh, then these are the kinds of serious issues. And of course, any talk about Terminator robots and stuff like that would be silly, right? Um, 
Now, there's a different context, which is the long term, where perhaps um, we would have capabilities and characteristic uses, such as automation being able to substitute for most human labor, maybe very advanced AI assistants that um, uh, may maybe, maybe you could imagine uh, space colonization and cures for many diseases through sort of AI-enabled research, more tightly integrated interactions between humans and, and machines. Um, so if, if this is the context, like if we zoom ahead and think what, what might AI and some related information technologies enable us to do in the, in the long term, uh, th then I think a different set of issues rise to the fore. And in this context, I think serious issues would include things like uh, technological unemployment. Like at, at, at the moment and through most of history, uh, technology has been a complement to human labor. Human va labor is more valuable as a result of us being to operate machines. If, if machines become sufficiently generally capable of uh, doing what humans do, then um, automation might become a substitute for, for labor. Uh, and so at that um, juncture, you need to think more seriously about how to provide for people, whether it's retraining to jobs that remain uh, for humans or, or, or shift culture to emphasize other things than, than wage labor and you have to make economic provisions for that. Um, presumably, if, if we have this long-term future where machines are doing a lot, a lot of things throughout society that systemic risk system dependent, we will be very, very dependent on these systems and, and so anything that where there might be sort of emergent phenomena that cause unanticipated consequences or cyber attacks will become like a major Achilles heel. Um, we might have to start to think in this long-term context more seriously about the moral status of algorithms themselves. So think about uh, animals. Uh, most of us would agree that animals have various degrees of moral status. Um, if you want to conduct research, uh, medical research, and you need to use mice, there are regulations for how you should do that. It should be for a serious purpose. You need to anesthetize them before you operate on them. More advanced animals, you know, even greater strictures. Now, if machines start to achieve same, some of the same capabilities as, as these animals, like suppose you have some system that is able to navigate cluttered environments, make discriminations like, like a mouse can. And, um, at that point, I think the question starts to rise, like how advanced can these systems become before we need to begin to wonder whether not just how they affect us matters morally, but also what happens inside the box, inside the computer. Will these systems have some degree of sentience, ability to uh, feel pleasure and pain uh, like animals do? And um, I think in the long term, that is a serious issue. Um, virtual reality uh, goes along with this, uh, that uh, I think there might be big cultural debates about the role of this. Is, is like a kind of virtual experiences as, as good as um, real experiences? Or will society view that more as a sort of drug use, which is frowned upon? Um, what kind of VR experiences are OK? Like, if you had some computer game that created the experience, perfectly realistic experience of, of raping somebody, like, would that be acceptable? Or is that even if there's no actual victim there? Um, and, and transhumanism, the, uh, which, which we're already seeing, like bringing with <clears throat> um, these kinds of advances and in other fields, the, the, the idea being that, that human nature itself becomes to some extent malleable here, um, whether through sort of direct um, cyber implants, which I'm more skeptical about really being where the action is, or to biotechnology, but, but in general, we're kind of moving away from, further and further away from, from old school human nature, and I think that different cultures might, might, might place different emphasis on sort of remaining humans in the classical sense versus overcoming some of our natural limitations. <clears throat> so, um, the questions that are sort of serious, plausible, that, 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 <clears throat> that grown-up people could have a serious conversation about, I think differs depending on which of these contexts, and I think both are legitimate. Now, there is a further context here I call the deep future. Um, um, before I get to that, um, let me just say something about the timeline here. So, how, how long is the long-term future and the short-term? Um, 
We, we did a survey, so this, this is uh, as yet unpublished, just very recently done uh, er earlier this year, a couple of months ago, um, which is, I think, the biggest um, uh, opinion study done so far um, of um, AI experts. So we uh, polled a, a selection of authors accepted for NIPS and ICML um, and asked them a variety of questions. And so for some of these questions, one term we introduced uh, was high-level machine intelligence, which we defined as follows. Say we have a high-level machine intelligence when unaided machines can accomplish every task better and more cheaply than human workers. Uh, ignore aspects of tasks for which a human is intrinsically uh, advantaged, like being a, a jury member or, or being a priest or something like that, where it's not about what you do, but for whatever reason, we have decided that it has to be human who does it. So set aside those tasks, but also the functionally, instrumentally defined tasks. Um, and assume uh, that, that human scientific activity continues without some collapse of global civilization. Um, and so we asked a number of questions about the uh, timelines that people expected for this. And so we plot some of this here. The, um, the blue curve is from an earlier survey of a couple of years ago that we did on a smaller sample. Um, and as you can see here, if you look at the, the green curve, so this asked by what year do you think there is a 10% probability that we will have this high level machine intelligence or 50% probability or 90% probability. Um, you can see that the uh, um, median um, respondent thought there was a 25% probability of having high level machine intelligence within 25 years, if we ask the question in that way. Um, so that's like um, throwing two coins and getting heads both times. It's, um, if, if, if instead we ask the question, um, 10 years from now, what's the probability that we will have high-level machine intelligence? 50 years from now, what's the probability that we will have high-level machine intelligence? Um, we, we get the uh, red curve, which differs significantly from the green curve, even though, logically, uh, the outcomes are the same here. Um, you get significant framing effects, which suggests that you guys, well, maybe not you guys, but the people attended ICML and <laughs> are, are not very well probabilistically calibrated. Um, um, you, you get a slightly, uh, uh, let's see here, what does it say? It's about, um, you have to go up to 40 years from now to get 50% 50, 50 uh, probability and 25% probability would be, yeah. Um, let me see, that would be about 45 years from now, according to the red line. So somewhere in between those 25 years to 45 years from now, you'd have a 25% probability of having attained this, depending on how you frame the question. Um, um, we also tried asking it in a slightly different way, which I'm not going to explain, but basically if, if we ask people to consider their own special area and how far toward where that area needed to be to get high-level machine intelligence we've come and how long they expected it to take, and then if, if you ask the question that way, you got a slightly more aggressive uh, response where maybe um, 15, 20 years uh, from now, you would have a 25% probability. Um, uh, we also asked uh, um, uh, people to uh, divide the period you, you have been active in, in, in your area of specialization into two halves, the, the first half and the second half. In which half was progress faster? And the vast majority thinks progress was faster in the second half. So there's a general sense that things have been speeding up. Um, so we can't very, be very, um, and I don't think there is really an alternative um, source of information about the timelines that is going to be greatly more accurate than sampling. And so I think we just have to acknowledge there is like a big probability spread out over various arrival dates. Um, the majority opinion by a big margin seems to be that there is a more than a 50% chance that it will happen within uh, the lifetime of a lot of people alive today. Could happen much sooner, could take longer. That, that's about as precise as we can be. But at least it's not some sort of fringe crazy view that this could happen in our lifetime. Like this is actually the majority view among experts. Um, so I have argued that um, really rather than picturing these three contexts like this, the, the situation is, is perhaps better viewed as this. Um, that there is some period of time, we don't know how, 
how long, some, some decades perhaps, until we get to something roughly comparable to human level general intelligence. That's in this long-term context. But long-term might actually be a, a very brief period of time that once you get to that level, I think we will fairly shortly, if, if and when we get there, have super intelligence. Um, once we push to technological maturity, then you know, the deep future could stretch millions or billions of years into the future. It could last for a very long time. Um, we asked to try to get some sense of what, what people thought about that, that second step, the idea that if and when you do get some high-level machine intelligence, uh, how long will it take after that until, until you have something even much bigger? Um, so we asked about um, global technological improvement rate. Will, dramat will that dramatically increase after high-level machine intelligence? Dramatically increase meaning uh, like uh, by an order of magnitude, like 10x. So this is pretty radical. You would have like global uh, economy growing by um, like 50% a year or something like that or more. Um, and so we asked, what's the probability that this will happen within two years after achieving high level machine intelligence? What's the probability it will happen within 30 years? And uh, as you can see here, the proportion, if you look at the 50% proportion, uh, for two years, you have something like 15% um, probability or so um, that, that you would get this 10x. It's kind of a singularity, really. I mean, it's a, it's a relatively small probability, but the, the median opinion seemed to be that that had like a 15% chance of happening within two years. Um, but a very high probability of happening within 30 years, so you would get up to 80% uh, or something like that. So the, the median opinion seems to be that after we get to high-level machine intelligence, then after some number of years, um, perhaps uh, probably more than two years, maybe five, 10, 15, and at, that, at that point you will have this singularity-like event, or at least you will have maybe an order of magnitude speed up in global um, rates of technological improvement, which will presumably then like rapidly you know, push into even deeper forms of superintelligence. Um, uh, we, we asked again um, a, a slightly different question, which is um, how long after human, uh, or if, after high-level machine intelligence, will machine intelligence be vastly better than humans at all profession? Um, and so here you get a slightly more uh, conservative uh, timelines. Um, maybe people interpret vastly to be something like very radically beyond. Um, so, um, so let's see. So this deep future then, what, what would be the uh, kinds of, how, how would we characterize this? What are the kinds of capabilities that a technologically mature civilization would have uh, developed? And, and what are the issues that would be serious issues if, if the context of conversation were the deep future. Um, so I think that, I mean, for, for a start, it would mean the end of instrumental human labor. Like there would be maybe labor that we decided to do for, by, because we created some arbitrary rule that it had to be done by human or because we liked to do it. Um, but there would be nothing we would sort of have to do. Uh, and we would also, I think shortly after you have 10x imp like improvement that might then go to even higher multiples, uh, uh, start to approximate technological maturity, like a, a condition of civilization where you have developed um, all those general purpose technologies that we can already see are physically possible. Uh, it's just we have no way of constructing them yet. But you could see that such a system would be consistent with all the laws of physics, the material constraints, and so forth. Um, and that seems to include uh, but not be limited to this list, fully automated space colonization, like these von Neumann probes as they are known in the literature, like these would be automatic devices that could fly out to a planet, set up some manufacturing capability, and then build a base that would send out more von Neumann probes that could then start to uh, colonize the universe at some significant fraction of the speed of light. And not just in one direction, but you can have an exponential proliferation of these, so you, you have a sort of bubble of infrastructure with Earth in the center that is then growing at some 
significant speed, indefinitely perhaps, until the expansion of the cosmos makes it impossible to reach any more resources. Um, atomically precise manufacturing, so the, the kind of fast technological infrastructure that has control of matter on the um, atomic and molecular scale, the kind of nanotechnology that Eric Trexler was talking about in the 80s. Uh, we can create molecular simulation models. It looks like it's, you know, these systems will be stable. We have no way of putting them together, but if they were created, then they would you know, give us greatly increased control. Uh, in terms of human biology, radical transformations, not just that we would you know, cure some specific diseases, but human biology would become malleable, eliminating aging. Um, whole brain emulation looks like it would be feasible in this context, it's like uploading of human minds. Um, of course, there are some philosophical assumptions there, but in terms of actually getting a machine that would inherit the memories and behavioral dispositions of the original organic brain, um, fully realistic virtual reality, which if you then think about it, if you could create sort of uploaded creatures and artificial minds in fully realistic virtual realities, that means you have the ability to create simulated worlds that may be indistinguishable from the perspective of a participant from the original history. So you could create these ancestor simulations and maybe not just one, but maybe you could create many of these over the course of history. So that then leads down to the simulation argument, which is a different topic, but um, it's something I think one needs to think, take seriously if, if one is really thinking through the implications of what this might lead to. Fine-grained control of mental states. Um, so, so one error in, in terms of thinking, maybe, um, you know, what, what could we hope for in the future? Wouldn't it be boring if all problems have been solved? Well, here we have to uh, distinguish boring. Or if, if boring means like you would have to subjectively feel down and indifferent and, and feel the tedium, then no, that would not necessarily follow because if, if all you needed was to feel exhilaration and pleasure all the time, then that would presumably, we already have crude ways of doing that today with drugs, with side effects for short time. But in this context, it seems trivial to, to fine-grained molding of, of mental states. Now, there might be a different sense of boredom in which objectively speaking, you would be doing a repetitive task. You know, that's a more uh, intricate question, whether there is a sort of an infinite hierarchy of challenges that would add um, and um, goal system stability. So the uh, ability to engineer systems such that their, their objectives wouldn't drift over time, like whether it's humans or AIs at this point, um, they would have the ability to create, I think, successor versions of themselves that would have exactly the same goals. And, and other capabilities, but this would just be some of the types of capabilities that would be relevant if one wants to think about what the long-term Earth-ordinating civilization might look like. And the kinds of issues in this context that uh, would deserve serious consideration, um, again, the moral status of machines, like in this context, maybe most of the sentience um, by a wide margin will not be biological, it might be digital. And, if that were the case, then exactly the moral status of, of these uploads or AIs, if they, if they have uh, consciousness, would maybe be the most important question. Um, is, is there a singleton or not? Like, is the world order at this point, um, does it have a kind of unified decision making um, at, at the global level? Or is the world as it is today sort of splintered between a number of different, this seems to have ramifications for a, a range of different issues, um, whether we can solve global coordination problems. You kind of get two different classes of future scenarios depending on whether you assume we have a singleton or not. Um, so things like wars and arms races, uh, Malthusian outcomes, um, inability to control evolutionary development. So in a multipolar world, these seem potentially uh, disconcerting uh, in, in a singleton outcome, those might be avoided. On the other hand, you don't have this single point failure. Um, utopia concerns, like, so what would we actually want? Like, assuming you had this technological maturity, you had this complete control over human nature, over subjective states, you have astronomical amounts of resources that you might have secure possession of for, for billions of years. Like, what, what would actually be a good use of all of this? That, that um, is the advantage to the, Offense or defense. If if there are, if there is not a single ton, but there are instead rivaling faction. Like how easy is it to destroy stuff compared to create stuff? 
Like, is there some possible technology such that it's cheap to produce and it sort of creates some shockwave of disintegration and destruction, and therefore we are basically doomed unless you have a single thon, or could you have a stable multipolar world? This is, depends on unknown technological uh, factors. Um, and also relations to if, they are, if, they are, like, if there are other uh, super intelligent civilizations somewhere far in the universe, or, or, or simulators, if, if this is simulations, so like these kinds of issues become very important in this deep future context. And, and just as it would be kind of silly um, to introduce these if, if the context is a short term, um, equally it would be silly if the context is a deep future to, to sort of be worrying about these short term issues. They, they're both serious issues, but you just have to keep the context separate. Um, so, um, in view of this, if, if particularly we are thinking here about um, the long term and the deep future, that's, that's where most, that's, that's most of what's going to happen. Like there's going to be some few decades perhaps first and then the rest is going to be uh, the long term and the very long term. Um, so we have kind of two challenges to, to get a really excellent outcome here. So, so one is to make AI vastly more capable. Um, and then there is the second challenge, though, which is to make vastly more capable AI beneficial. Uh, and, and this is not a trivial challenge. Like, the first challenge is really hard, and like, a lot of bright people are working on, on that every day. Um, but the second challenge might be, we don't know, maybe it's equally hard. Uh, maybe it's harder, maybe it's easier. Um, it kind of breaks down into two problems. So, there is a technical problem of AI alignment safety. Like if, if you could build a really, really smart uh, machine, a very powerful optimization process, how could you ensure that uh, that, that would actually do what you intended it for it to do? Um, and then there is a policy problem. What, what kind of governance structures could be uh, developed to sort of guide this, this very advanced capability, assuming you have solved a technical problem. Like if the AI is not controllable, then you've already lost there. But assuming you solve a technical problem, you, you confront the policy problem. So I'll, I'll say something about each of these, um, but I'll, I'll set aside uh, the, the kind of technological question. So um, starting with this technical problem. So to s simplify somewhat, the, the basic challenge there that I see is um, scalable control. And you'd want a method for ensuring that your system behaves as intended, that is scalable in the sense that it will continue to work, preferably work better as the AI system becomes more and more capable. Um, if, if you're building, if you're trying to figure out a way how to sort of get a good outcome in the long term and the very long term. And so this, this means that we might want to make various assumptions, conservative assumptions that in this context, for example, uh, it would be unconservative to assume that humans will always be able to control a reward channel. So right now, you, you could imagine having a kind of reinforcement learning where, you, where you, the system does something good, basically you have somebody pressing a kind of reward button, it does something badly. Now, this is not a scalable control method. If the system becomes sufficiently intelligent, sufficiently powerful, it will then have incentives uh, to do things that might, to seize control of the reward button, right? Um, to prevent you from punishing it. The system here is fundamentally at odds with you and only as long as you remain stronger and smarter will this control method work. So it's not scalable. Um, it would be conservative in this context to uh, assume that the AI is capable of strategic behavior. Um, just as humans are. We can anticipate how other people might react, what they're going to do, and then plan around that. A super intelligence also would be able to do this, perhaps at a superhuman level of competence. A deception, uh, it, it might be capable and, and might be capable also of seeing why it could be useful for it to do so, to say, uh, conceal some of its capabilities, to uh, not, not reveal just how far advanced it is, to make sure that we keep running it for longer until it's maybe so capable that it no longer needs to be concerned about what we would do. Uh, it would be a conservative assumption here to assume that a super intelligent AI might be capable of producing verbal hyperstimuli, that is like arguments uh, that would be persuasive to humans whether or not the arguments were actually correct or not, like to be super persuasive. Um, it would be conservative to assume that the AI might at some point 
manage to get access to actuators. So, so maybe as an extra safety precaution, what you would want to like unplug the Ethernet cable, put it in a Faraday cage or whatever, but you shouldn't assume that, that that's your ultimate safeguard. Like you, sooner or later it will out. Um, and you want the AI to be safe even, even when that happens. Um, even if it doesn't directly have like access to a robotic arm, it might be able to persuade humans to work as its arms and legs. There are uh, a lot of gullible people on the internet that are willing to. Um, anyway, so um, one, and, and, and I'm not, I'm not going to be able to do a full review here, but uh, one type of control method that would be scalable if it can be made to work is this idea of value alignment. So if you could get the AI um, to actually share our human values, to, want, to, to share our goals, then you have a scalable control. Like the smarter the AI gets, the better it would be at achieving what we wanted it to achieve. Um, and the, uh, the challenge there that we face, um, and this would really be the cleanest solution, if you could get the AI to want the same thing that we do, then it's on our side, right? It's an ally, not, not some pot possibly hostile thing that you have to sort of box up and control. Uh, so, so, so this, this involves a number of technical challenges that, that um, um, revolve around the difficulty of specifying formally what it is that we want. Um, and you can see analogs of this back in myths and, and uh, legends. King Midas uh, asked that everything he touches be turned into gold. Seems like a good idea, like can become very rich. And then he touches his food, it turns into gold. He touches his daughter, she turns into gold sculpture. And so it turns out that in his like, specification of his wish, he forgot to include some necessary qualifications. There is this risk of misspecification. Um, and in general, it seems to be, this Stuart Russell has observed that um, if some, if, if you try to specify an objective function and you omit some parameters of human values, some things we actually care about, then those omitted uh, parameters tend to be set to extreme values by a maximally efficient policy for maximizing the objective that you did include in your formal specification. Um, and in, in this technical literature, this is often referred to as paperclip uh, AI. The, the idea here is a cartoon example, but it stands in for a wide class of failures. You build an AI maybe to uh, operate your paperclip factory to make as many paperclips as possible. And when the AI is quite limited, the only way it can make more paperclips is by running the factory more efficiently and everything works fine. Once the AI becomes sufficiently strong, sufficiently intelligent, it figures out that there are now new strategies in its, like new plans in its planning space that it can access. That, that leads to many more paperclips, like building more paperclip factories, preventing humans from switching off, um, acquiring more resources, making yourself even smarter. And, you get kind of the future light cone or a significant fraction of it um, optimized for paper clips, just universe full of paper clips. Um, so you can plug in almost any other value there and, and it's uh, actually quite tricky to, um, to, to, to specify um, some objective such that we would actually be happy if that objective were sort of optimally instantiated. Um, the, the, the key clearly seems to be um, in um, leveraging the AI's intelligence to uh, learn what it is that we want. Like, rather than, you, you couldn't create like a long, like Asimov's laws of robotics, like a long list that, that's just doomed to failure. Uh, but um, using value learning to have an AI somehow, A, being able to infer what it is that we want, our preferences, and, and B, then being motivated to act on the preferences it has inferred that we have. It's not sufficient that it figures out what we want. It also has to share that. Um, so, so that involves a number of research challenges, and, 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 and this is one of the more recent. So in the last, just in the last uh, couple of years, there have started to emerge these technical research agendas that um, are aimed to begin to address uh, this problem and, and a related set of control uh, challenges. Um, and it, it's still early days, so this is not by any means like the definitive list. It might well be that the best approach has not yet been conceived of, but there are a number of little threads now that we can start to tug on. Um, and a number of these have been developed to the point where you could imagine assigning a sub-problem to a PhD student and you could actually get some, some research done um, on, the, on this. Um, there are a few papers now also starting to happen on this. We just had one recent uh, one with um, 
in collaboration with Laurent also from uh, DeepMind on uh, the specific, this is a small, small sub part of this, this overall challenge, but of how you could engineer utility functions such that the agent pursuing that utility function would be indifferent to being shut down. Like for most utility functions, the agent pursuing that utility function would have an instrumental reason to avoid being shut down because if it's around in the future, it can continue to optimize the original utility function. So is there a clever trick that you could use so as to make it indifferent to us pressing an off switch button? Um, also such that the agent doesn't get an incentive to try to persuade us to push the off switch button. You want genuine. So, so there are these little things that are starting to happening. Um, even more recently, as in last week, uh, uh, there was another um, research agenda published by uh, uh, um, Google uh, Brain in collaboration with OpenAI, um, which is focused more on um, a set of challenges that have dual use, as it were. They're also more tightly coupled to current practice and with potential application for present-day machine learning systems, as well as being designed with an eye of actually helping with this longer-term challenge. Um, so it involves research into avoiding negative side effects, like how can we assure that an AI will not disturb its environment in negative ways while pursuing its goal, like um, avoiding reward hacking. How can we uh, avoid gaming the reward function? We don't want, say, a vacuum cleaning robot uh, when it becomes a little bit clever to learn that it can get more reward by covering over the messes it makes uh, so that it can't see them itself. Um, scalable oversight. Um, if, if you have a, a system that depends on human feedback, um, how, how can you achieve a method of doing that so that uh, it can go for long periods without requiring too much? And if, if you want ultimately a very autonomous system that can you know, do a lot of things instead of you, you don't want to have to sort of micromanage it or, or review every single small, that, that would kind of defeat the purpose. Uh, safe exploration, how can you and then an AI system that can explore its environment to learn, but, but in a way that avoids uh, things with very negative repercussions, like a vacuum cleaner maybe should experiment with different ways of mopping the floor, but it shouldn't sort of do random. Um, robustness to distributional shifts, like how can we create algorithms that are better able to detect when the underlying uh, situation they're in has changed? Um, um, for example, um, if, if the base rate at which it encounters different uh, features has, has changed because of some a different application environment from the training environment, then like how, how can you make algorithms that are you know, ideally able to adapt to that or at the minimum are able to recognize it and maybe adopt a more conservative approach? Um, so so th these are kind of continuous with things you could imagine people working on because they're interested in shorter term issues, but, but the actual problems are also, I know the people like selected specifically because they kind of are maybe also helpful towards moving towards uh, the kind of capability control you would need to control a super intelligent system. Um, back, back to our survey. So we also asked um, how much should society prioritize AI safety research relative to how much it is currently prioritized? Um, and. Um, uh, there, there's like a few people think that it was prioritized too much. Uh, um, that, that was a kind of uh, um, uh, quite strong contingent who thought they should receive more or much more, and, and, and or some people thought it received about the right amount. But I, I should say that the amount of attention it receives now is vastly greater than two years ago. Not because it receives that much attention now, but because two years ago it received virtually nil. Well, that was like my research group and uh, Machine Intelligence Research Institute in Berkeley. They're basically two uh, groups and a few scattered individuals who were, were like thinking about super intelligence controls. And that now it's become, even just over the last two years, a, a much bigger but still very, very small field. Um, and, and there's like some kind of organizational infrastructure and grant infrastructure starting to be developed to support that. Um, so, so some progress on the technical problem, not so much in having the solutions yet, but in uh, gaining um, recognition that there actually is a problem there, that like, it would be a sensible thing f for some researchers to study. Um, now, what about the policy problem? Um, so, so there, things are at a much earlier stage. Um, and, uh, and we are maybe with a policy problem where we were with a technical problem two, three years ago. Like there is not yet even quite anything analogous to these research agendas. 
um, I, I've suggested that um, the, the kind of it, it would be good to embed from as early on as possible in, in the field and in society's um, uh, perspectives on this, that if, if superintelligence ever is to be developed, this full, general, powerful, sort of end of the present human condition kind of superintelligence, then it should be developed for the benefit of all of humanity and in the service of widely shared ethical ideals. It's, too, it's, it's not just another gadget, like it's too big to be something that is designed merely to enhance a particular corporation's profit line or even one nation's military uh, strength, like it really should be done for the benefit of all. Uh, it's consistent with commercial incentives along the path, but, but if one day the jackpot were hit, then there needs to be a vision that this, this should be for a larger good. Like everybody would share in the risks, whether or not they like it, and everybody should also have a slice in the upside. Um, so, so there are a number of um, policy challenges, I think, that might possibly develop into some kind of agenda for, for action or research. This is specifically with the context being the long term and, and the very long term. Um, so one issue is uh, technology race dynamics, um, which interacts with the uh, technical problem. So suppose you have a situation, you know, maybe 20 years from now, eight years from now, like when research has moved quite close. So it's now starting to become clear that we'll get all the way to high level and super intelligence within a short period of time. Like, how competitive is the landscape at that point? You might prefer a development scenario in which whoever it is that develops the first super intelligence has the ability um, to, say, pause for six months after they have basically figured out how to make the machine super intelligent, so as to be able to install the safety and control mechanisms. Maybe that can only be done after you have the basic architecture in place. And so as to be able to test and you know, make sure that everything works as intended. In, in a completely open development scenario, we have many, many different competitors. Maybe the lead developer is like only like two days up on the next one if it's open source and limiting case. Like it's just no ability to slow down. It will happen as soon as it can happen. Um, and if, if, if it turns out that it requires a little bit of extra work to make it safe than just to make it work, then that would be doomed in that scenario. So, uh, mitigating these race dynamics, uh, thinking about whether there are ways in which one can organize the field so that there might more plausibly be some ability to coordinate towards them might, might be important. Uh, um, and con continuing to ensure public um, support for this uh, endeavor, uh, the ethics of artificial minds, um, providing uh, for, for, for um, people's uh, livelihoods um, if, if, if if, if, if their jobs become automated. Uh, distributional uh, fairness, this really, I think, comes in two flavors. If, if one imagines this sort of future for earth originating civilization locking up, like who gets to control all of this? Um, and I think we can kind of subdivide that to who gets to share in the benefits, like how does the wealth get distributed, and, and who gets to have influence over how society is organized, how this whole thing being used. And, um, my, my basic view there is that it's kind of like a, a mammoth hunt that is when, when one of our hunter-gatherer tribe ancestors like killed a big mammoth like that, it's just so much meat um, that it doesn't make sense to squabble over exactly, you know, how many pounds of meat does each person get. Like there's just, let's, let's make sure like, everybody should get a massive amount. And then as long as that's the case, then if somebody gets slightly more, I mean, fine, whatever. But uh, more broadly, that we should aim for a future that uh, like, does well by the criteria of a wide range of different values. Every value that can sort of be maxed out quite easily should just be maxed out. And then we can have a conversation about how the rest of the resources should be used. Um, how to achieve cooperation in a world with where there, if, if there are multiple super intelligences, whether multiple AIs built by humans or if there are other AIs in the universe. Um, and in general, then I had to, to kind of construct some actually desirable long-term trajectory, like that would kind of, we could look forward to living in, that would be good. Um, so there is a lot growing interest in, in this policy. There's like a series of um, workshops recently. This uh, is on more short-term issues. Um, um, 
organized by the White House, the, the UK government is also trying to get a better sense for what AI is, what it will mean for governance. This is still at the very earliest stages. Policymakers just have, a, they hear noise and they feel the government doesn't yet kind of have a grip on what it is. Um, uh, there is also some research, we're just setting up the Strategic Artificial Intelligence Research Center at Oxford University as an extension of the FHI. It also thinks specifically about these policy and strategy questions. Um, so I want to just uh, conclude um, um, by, by comparing that. So this is a picture of global warming, like the science behind it, different milestones. You can see it goes back over 100 years. The basic problem was recognized. It takes a long time sometimes uh, between the initial recognition that maybe there is some kind of issue to, and we're still not quite there yet in the case of global warming, when we actually have got our act together to respond. So in case... Uh, the AI technical problem and our policy problem turn out to be uh, similarly difficult. It seems worth for me to, to get started earlier rather than later. Um, one thing we also asked our survey participants was how optimistic they were about the outcome if this high level machine intelligence um, were achieved. You know, being practitioners in the field, you'd not be surprised that it was kind of um, biased towards good. People, I mean, kind of perverse to spend your life trying to advance a field that you were convinced would lead to universal death and destruction. Um, nevertheless, um, people did assign a, a, a very non-trivial amount of probability mass also to outcome being um, on balance bad or even actually being an existential catastrophe, a human catastrophe, like um, between 5 and 10 percent, depending on exactly how you sort of tote the numbers up. Um, which, given the, the, the values, uh, what's at stake there is like, you know, would be worth a big investment to me, it seems, uh, to, to try to push that down. If it's 10%, like, can we get it down to 9% or 8% like that? If you just calculate the expected utility of that, given how long and big the future can be, it's like astronomical. Um, uh, which is why it surprised me a little bit to, to see also this, um, which is that we asked how, how valuable it is to work on these problems now. Um, relative to other problems, um, and, uh, and many people thought it was less less valuable, um, perhaps much less valuable. Um, so I hope that um, what what I have tried to uh, to, to, to argue for by um, um, you know showing the progress that has already been made in developing these research agendas, actually starting to make technical research, and and how big the the uh, values are on the line, that that perhaps we should kind of shift this distribution and, and it looks like these problems are as valuable as other problems to work on are in my view actually more valuable. Thank you very much. <laughs>